Welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. This is a space where we seek to create and cultivate healthy conversations between those things we geek out on and the philosophical and theological questions that often arise out of our fandoms. Like, what does it mean to be human? What makes a hero? What makes a villain? How do the stories and narratives we geek out on shape how we live in the world? We are your priest to the geeks. We aren't all ordained, but we see ourselves as mediators at the intersection of geek culture and going deeper in our faith. We don't always have to agree, but we do respect each other, and we see everyone as a beloved child of God. Everyone geeks out on something, so come geek out with us and enjoy the show. You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Hello, welcome to another episode of Systematic Geekology. We are your priests to the geeks, and by that we mean that we are curators, facilitators, mediators. Some would say geekologists to help curate those things we geek out on and the bigger questions that arise out of our fandoms. We are your geekologists that try to go deep into our fandoms and perhaps some really important questions will rise to the surface. Today's episode is a what if episode and not only a what if episode, but a Star Wars what if episode. And I have to make a confession um, I've been what ifing Star Wars since 1978 with my Star Wars action figures. And so I'm really excited about this episode and um, what could come out of it and how this could change the narrative and the mythos around Star Wars. Man, I love these kind of episodes. And you demanded it. You voted for it. We vote for it online, on, on Facebook and other places. And so this is the question that rose to the surface. What if Count Dooku trained Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so I can't do this episode alone. I'm going to bring on some friends, some geeks, and they're going to help us out uh, with uh, what ifing this particular question. And when I bring them to the surface, when I bring them here to uh, this YouTube video, to the to the screen, they're going to share with you the first Star Wars movie they ever saw. So first up, we're going to have our friend, John. John, what was the first Star Wars movie you ever saw? There we go. Had some mic issues. Anyway, the first Star Wars movie I ever saw. That would definitely have been the 1999 special edition VHS of the original trilogy. That's what my dad had, and that's what I grew up on. There you go. So you got that awkward Jabba the Hutt in A New Hope where Han stepped on Jabba's tail walking over him. You saw that? Sure did. That's that's the version I grew up with. (laughs) Nice. All right. Cool. All right. Next, we have our friend Andy. Andy, what was the first Star Wars movie you ever saw? Uh, it was almost certainly Return of the Jedi, and probably whatever version was broadcast on you know TV uh, uh, in the early '80s, early mid '80s. Nice. So you saw Return of the Jedi in the theater? No, no, no. Re- recorded off of the television, uh, you know, at a home VCR or something like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. That's a good one. All right, TJ, what was the first Star Wars movie you ever saw? Phantom Menace. Phantom. On DVD. Mm-hmm. Phantom Menace on DVD. Nice, yeah. nice. That's the first one I remember. Right. And we know what your favorite one is, right? Attack of the Clones? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, by far. <laughs> Easily. Easily. Well, friends, yeah. Hi, friends. I'm 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 Will, and uh, and yeah, I am. Um, the first movie I saw I've shared before was A New Hope in the theater, 1977. Five year old little William saw A New Hope in the theater, and then I could not wait to see the next one when it came out. And man, Empire Strikes Back just blew me away as a fan, and been following ever since. And so, uh, yeah, huge Star Wars fan, and uh, love this 
medium and the sci-fi and the story that it tells and the imagination that it sparks in everyone. And I can't wait to get this up into this episode. But before we do that, I would like to know what we are all geeking out on. There's so much geeky content out there. There's so much to geek out on. It's hard to keep track of it all. Um, but we'll go around this way. TJ, you go first. What, uh, what, what do you, um, if it's not a video game, if it's not Valorant, what are you geeking out on? What if it's a different video game? Okay. What if it's, okay, yeah, okay, it's Minecraft? I'm ready. Yeah. Mine, Minecraft. Minecraft. Yeah. Uh, we some friends of mine started a modded Minecraft server, and mm-hmm. it's crazy. Nice. It's nice. nuts. We have spaceships and guns and thorium. That's. I'm not sure what the thorium is for yet. <laughs> That's why I keep playing. John, what are you geeking out on these days, buddy? All right. So. Um, I've gotten Barbara started on Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order on the PS5. And and, um, I've already played through it once, but she hasn't played through it. And she's a big fan of the Nathan Drake uh, Uncharted games. So this is kind of like a happy marriage between my geeky Star Wars-y obsession and um, her being able to do an exploration game. And she is a completionist, so she will have lots of fun exploring the dungeons. (laughs) Nice. That's good. I like it. I like it. Andy, what have you been geeking out on? Uh, probably the thing I'm geeking out the most on lately is the uh, Big Biology Podcast. Uh, it's been around for a while, but I just started uh, listening. So, you know, biologists come on and talk about their latest research, their latest books. Uh, and uh, so I've been just kind of plowing through the back catalog there. Ah, man, I love that decap. You know, I was thinking maybe, you know, you and I are X-Men fans. So we we were talking off air right before this, uh, the, the X-Men reboot coming up, the uh, X-Men animated series. Um, yeah, uh, but but no, you went with the Biology podcast. I love it. Have you heard of the podcast Ologies? It's just called uh, Ologies. I, I have heard of it. I have not given that one a try yet. My my daughter, who's um, a biology uh, major at um, Appalachian State, uh, said she had been listening to it. She used to always pick on me for listening to so many podcasts. Uh, and then she goes, Dad, I found a cool podcast. I think you would like it, Ologies. And she goes into all the ologies that are out there and, and kind of science and background. It's very well edited and is pretty good, too. Yeah, a lot of good podcasts out there. I'll show you where I'm geeking out on. I, yeah, I, I, it's a good time to be an X-Men fan. I Man, those, those are comics I grew up on, and I like what's happening in the comics now and this upcoming reboot with with creative teams. And the X-Men animated series just blew me out of the water. And um, I loved how that series landed, and and I'm pretty, pretty stoked on X-Men right now. So uh, in the comic world, comic realm, man, um, uh, they, they keep luring me. They keep luring me. Every, every now and then I'm like, oh, maybe maybe comics as a medium has, has fallen kind of stale or maybe maybe I could go into other things and and then boom they they do it again they lure me in they get a creative team or get a new idea and throw it at me I love comics uh so so that's where we are uh and so it's time to get into the meat mm. of the episode I would I would be remiss uh to move on okay. without mentioning to, okay. to John and Barb you know, I'll tell later I am a Drake like of the Francis Drake Nathan Drake line but i'm real yeah oh, like a seventh son of a seventh son yeah you're a legend well my grandma's dad's 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 dad is francis drake oh that's that's awesome that is so sick i think that deserves a, a celebration i i think you're gonna be the only person who's gonna be able to unlock some secret tomb with your uh, your bloodline or something, I don't yeah, know. That's that's the goal. I uh, don't want to dive too far into it now, but it does involve diving, and it is in a cave, and it might be where he hid some treasure. <laughs> I, I'm curious where that came up from. What's the context of bringing up Drake? Uh, Uncharted. He mentioned Uncharted. It. Uncharted. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now I'm making the geek connections. Love it. All right, y'all. So here here's our episode. Uh, we are we are doing. What if Count Dooku trained Obi-Wan Kenobi? And before we jump into like what that would mean to both of these characters and what it would mean to like the ongoing story of Star Wars, you know, I I like to share with others, you know, we all what if in our lives. And uh, what if is a good, um, I think, tool and helpful thought experiment to help us kind of sort through things in our lives. Now, we could be obsessed with it and what if ourselves to death and like it it could paralyze us in, in, in our decisions. We have to make decisions. We have to move. But but yeah, there are certain decisions we make or don't make that have an effect on the 
our worlds, other people's worlds and relationships and continuities. And so, so yeah, the decisions we make and the actions we, we take uh, make a difference in this world. And so whether it's a big decision or a small decision, it has an effect on others. And so when we what if or do this what if experiment within these episodes, we're, we're trying to tinker with it a little bit and turn that that prism just, just a little bit or turn that diamond just a little bit to try and get a different view and maybe some other things about this fandom or our lives will, will come to, to the surface. And so maybe a little bit more uh, later on when it comes to that. But but that's kind of why we do this thought experiment of what ifing because it helps us kind of think deeper uh, with with the fandoms we love and this this particular IP of Star Wars, but but also maybe in our lives. It can help us kind of think through uh, the important decisions we make in our lives and the in the relationships that are entrusted to us. And so as we think about this what if question, what if Count Dooku trained Obi-Wan Kenobi? Let's go with a little bit um, before we, we need to know a little bit about their history and their their background. And and I'll just you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi has has been there from the beginning as as an older um weathered Jedi on the sands of Tatooine who's overlooking and watching uh, a young Skywalker. And, and we come to find out his story more and more and more throughout this series, even as a force goes in his background and history. And then, of course, in the prequels, he shows up as a Padawan or, or a uh, what, what was his official title when he shows up in, in a Phantom Menace? He's not. Is he a Padawan? Is, is he a master? Is he a knight? What it What, what is he? Qui-Gon? Uh, no, uh, Obi-Wan. Qui-Gon? Obi-Wan is a Padawan at that point. He's a Padawan yeah. at that point, so he still has he's his the braid. He's just older. Yeah, he's got the braid. He got the braid, just an older Padawan. Later, he gets moved moved on up. But but then we follow him as as young Obi Wan through through the the prequels and the Clone Wars and that kind of thing. We know his his story some, but Count Dooku uh, he shows up first uh, in. Um, Let's see. Uh, yeah. Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones. That's the first movie he shows up in. And he's a little bit more mysterious, but they unpack his story a little bit later on when it comes to Tales of the Jedi, the first season Tales of the Jedi. You get a little bit of the backstory, a little bit more there. There's been some books. There's been other things. Uh, he was, showed up in the, the Clone Wars animated series. Um, uh, but, but you know, of course, we know more about Obi-Wan. We've lived with him longer. Count Dooku is a little, little different, but uh, his effect in terms of his approach to the force and the dark side of the force and why he rebelled and, and what that meant and, and his stage of what that meant to Anakin and helping him turn to the dark side or choices he makes uh, are pretty significant. So um, any, any of my co-hosts here, what, what, are we, what do we need to know about Count Dooku that would affect if he trained Obi-Wan Kenobi? What was significant about Count Dooku that that makes a difference? So, Count Dooku really liked to emphasize the swordsmanship, uh, you know, with the lightsaber. And that's something that shows in his apprentices, which was just kind of unfortunate that the only one we really get to spend time with is Qui-Gon. And then right. he fights Darth Maul, which, you know, kind of not great for like a first real lightsaber fight. <laughs> right. He loses. Uh, but yeah, a little. Just a little. But uh, right. that's that's really Dooku's whole thing was training the swordsmanship. He's very force aware, but he's not reliant on it. And he honors the elegance of the blade, the lightsaber. And I think a lot of that does just come from him being Christopher Lee, Mm. who is like a a master fencer and war veteran and stuff. But it's Sir Christopher Lee. Sir Christopher Lee. Yeah. And showed uh, up in some Tolkien and some Willy Wonka, the chocolate factory. He he showed up in a couple places. Yeah. And I, I love... Uh, I used to read like the Star Wars encyclopedias when I was younger and uh, they were all like uh, Dooku's lightsaber was designed so that he could get special movements out of his wrist so that he could confuse his enemies. Ah, he's got that kind of Super curved cool. hilt, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's good. Good point. Good point when it comes to that. Andy, what 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 are we getting here in terms of um, Count Dooku and what we need to know about his approach to the force and the his, the, his history that might have affect mm-hmm. Well, it's probably significant that he was trained by Yoda. Yeah. Right? Okay. So that is, uh, that's also part of his backstory is that he was a, he was a Padawan to Yoda. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head how many, uh, Jedis were trained by Yoda in that way over his 900 plus years of life. But, uh, uh, so the ones we know about are Mace Windu and Ki Adi Mundi. Ah. Okay. Maybe we'll learn more in the Acolyte whether, uh, he yeah. had more Padawans if he shows up. 
Yeah, that's that's good, um, Andy. Like that. Like, yeah, he Count Dooku was trained by Yoda. Um, that was his mentor. Yeah, John. And also, no, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Andy. Well, maybe John will bring it up. So go ahead. <laughs> what what we should know about Count Dooku? I think. Yeah, what's um, the there? He has a different type of perspective, also with his um, social status and upbringing, and it would bring a different dynamic, I think, into it with. Uh, with his interactions, I think with Obi Wan, like him being literally a count, like a leader of of like, a, is it a entire planet or is it a civilization island? Where where was he like a ruler? It come from like a um, high class, kind of like a high class society on a on a planet, not strictly like the planet's leader, but um, kind of in charge of their little government. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't Tales of the Jedi. I feel like I need to really dive into that. I kind of watched a couple episodes and got distracted. I watched the- yeah. I, I think that is helpful getting into to his a little bit because you see kind of like him, you know, he, yeah, so he was trained by Yoda. He also uh, was a mentor, helped train Qui-Gon. And then you see Qui-Gon had like a different, you know, his his whole point was um, his dedication to the Force, not necessarily to the organized religion around the Force. So he was like, yeah, let's listen to the Force. Yeah, this is helpful. This Jedi Order is is important, uh, but the Force is more important than the Jedi Order that is built around. And so uh, that frustrated Obi Wan Kenobi a little bit. He's a rule follower. Obi Wan's a rule follower, and uh, and and though while while Yoda helped mentor him some too, uh, um, Qui Gon, you know, would would kind of push the envelope when it comes to that. So I think even even um, Count Dooku, if, if he trained um, Qui-Gon or, or as a mentor to him, then some of that must have rubbed off a little bit, that it's more about the Force. And, and so got disenfranchised or deconstructed or, or got disillusioned by some of the actions of the Jedi Order that made him think, like, maybe they aren't on the right path. Uh, I, I disagree with them. So he actually, he was there in the Jedi Order and then left to go be a Count and Ruler. And it was there that he was wooed by Sidious to be uh, a Sith Lord or to the dark side of the Force to be nip- to be manipulated to kind of create this civil war among um, among the republic, so that uh, eventually, of course, Sidious could could rule over as as empire, not not as republic. Um, so, so I think I, it is something about the Jedi Order. Maybe you guys know something about like you know they they don't keep you there if you want to leave. Yeah, you you join it, you learn the ways of the Force, but if you, there's a certain point that you're like, you know, I I'm bound out. I I don't want to be a part of this anymore. They let you go. They're not going to be like, well. Then, then we're going to throw you in prison for living us. It's not like necessarily a cult that you have to stay. Um, it is, um, it is. Uh, you know, he, he was able to leave and say, "Fine, forget y'all. I'm moving on and go hang out the planet." Any, anything there that I'm forgetting, or was in books or comics or something? Andy, do you know any more that we should mention? Well, I mean, to, developing on that point, right there, we see uh, him or, or his uh, face memorialized. In the in the Jedi uh, temple or in the Jedi uh, training area, uh, as as one of these uh, twenty Jedi that have that have gone uh, away from the the order at different times, uh, not all at once, but over various generations, there were different people that, that walked away and they chose to memorialize them with uh, with busts. Uh, so you know, that not not only did they allow it, but you know, there was a certain sense of like this is this is something we want to remember. This is something we want to uh, keep. In it. Uh, in the forefront as part of our history rather than trying to, hmm. you know, cover it up or kind of pretend like it didn't happen or, you know, only mention it if asked sort of thing. Yeah. yeah so it's not why... like he was excommunicated. <laughs> he wasn't excommunicated. Right, yeah. he, he left and like, we, we remember his impact here in the Jedi order. Yeah. TJ. Yeah. That, that's why I miss legends because uh-huh. in, in legends, one of the reasons that Dooku left the order was because he had an apprentice who left the order. And now that just doesn't exist. Right. She was really cool, though. Her name was Kamari Vosa. She was super strong. Nice. She used two sabers. Oh, like, that's out of interest, right? Yeah. Um, TJ, do I, do, I, do I see a, a slide there you want to share? Is there I do. There I, found found? A, I found a nice little uh, nice little okay. master Throw apprentice chart, um, there. which is just from a user on Reddit. You know, full credit. <laughs> His name is uh, Valdemar209. I didn't have time to, like, make one of these myself. I found this one. I think it's pretty good. Well, thanks for uh, giving credit or praise. Too. That's important. Yeah. Yeah. It shows us like we've got, you know, Yoda, Luke, obviously, who I forgot to mention earlier, but I guess he counts. Oh, they didn't really train that kid. <laughs> Kiati Mundi Mace, Count Dooku, Asajj, Grievous, Qui Gon, Savage. Yeah, it, it goes on. He actually 
I think, I guess the chart could tell us if we just look at it, but Dooku, I think, had the most apprentices with the most screen time. Yeah, that's interesting. That That's a good point. I'm glad you found that. But you see how they're interconnected and there's within the Jedi Order and their approaches to the Force in this community, they they help mentor. There's there's a high committee, you know, that kind of rules things. There's bishops and archbishops and and, and whatever. And, and I guess Yoda's is about as a pope as you could be when it comes to the Jedi Order. But I, I think you see how they're in, interconnected and uh, the Force does what it does uh, outside of, of them and, and all of kind of living beings. But we have these people who practice it, who wield it, who, who study it, and, and they have their own, uh, just like their personalities are, are different, um, and just like in this world, our personalities are different. And, and you know, while, while I consider myself a Christian, I'm, and John's a Christian, I, our personalities, we might approach it from a different angle to help each other or help each other um, see it in a different light. And so that's the same way when it comes to the Force as well. So it is important to kind of think through when we do this, what if. Now, now um, we talked a little bit about Count Duca. Now, now Obi Wan. What do you know about his kind of his approach to the Force? How does he think of it? Like standard canon storyline of of Obi Wan. What's your impression of of how Obi Wan approaches the Living Force and, and the community of the Force? If you'd like to support our show on Captivate, feel free to go to Captivate.fm and. Um, Find our show, subscribe. You'll get access to any future online D&D campaigns over there. You'll get an extra bonus question for four to eight times a month. You'll get extra content like that through there. Um, you also get a one-time donation you could make to help support the show right on Captivate. So you don't get anything for the one-time donation. But if you would like to just support the show once, do a quick donation, you can do that through Captivate.fm. Our overhead includes editing software, marketing, equipment, recording software, and a whole lot of other stuff. And um, we really appreciate everybody who can help keep the lights on. John, we'll start with you, buddy. I think Obi-Wan has a very deep trust of the Force, but sometimes he gets distracted and uh, in the uh, Jedi Order and a lot of the rule following and other stuff gets him kind of distracted so he doesn't necessarily connect as well as I think he could as seen in... Um, like the Kenobi show where hmm. he keeps trying to connect to Master Qui-Gon but can't because his he's got the inner turmoil and the regret and surprise that um Anakin's still alive and turned into Darth Vader and there's a lot of emotional trauma he basically has to get over in order to uh wield the force again and get connected to it. Yeah, good point. Yeah. And there's a reason why he's like I'm sending yeah, he well, he 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 trains Luke a little bit and kind of does that prep work, but but when when he is struck down, when becomes one with the Force and leaves after uh, the the first movie, uh, A New Hope, um, Episode Four, um, there's a reason he sends him to to Yoda. Yes, Yoda's still alive, but but he doesn't train him in the kind of the Force Ghost way. He sends him to someone else, perhaps maybe. Yoda has, he's older, has more wisdom, um, but maybe not as much trauma when it comes to that. But yeah, I think you're right. Obi-Wan's a, a, a rule follower. Um, he takes on maybe, you know, that, that grief of losing Qui-Gon, but then, you know, he takes on the mantle of training Anakin, the chosen one, and there's some, there's some guilt there. There, he, he didn't quite, um, he feels some guilt that, that, yeah, he didn't quite complete that mission and that his apprentice fell to the dark side. Um, Andy, what, what's your thoughts on kind of Obi-Wan's, uh, the original Jedi wizard that we were like, oh, there he is, the, the mysterious one, his approach to the living force. Yeah, uh, you know, I think Obi-Wan, you know, apart from that, uh, that first film, you know, the Phantom Menace, right, he, he sort of always comes across as older than, than his years. Hmm. Um, and, you know, all the, for all the reasons, you know, all the things he's been through, all, all of that uh, that he's experienced, uh, I think he's just sort of the, the world-weary uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stick with this, right? This is, this is the right path, but man, is, is it costly? And, and does it weigh me down to, to go this way? And, you know, maybe that's why in, what is it? 10 years, he goes from looking like you and McGregor to <laughs> looking like, uh, Alec Alec <laughs> um, it's, it's a rough life. It's a rough but, life. Uh, yeah. yeah. That, that desert wind, man, uh, really Oof. ages you, mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, you know, he, I mean, I, I and, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know, Christian experience and so forth. Uh, I, I think there's kind of a strong, uh, prophet Elijah kind of vibe of, um, I'm all alone. You know, I'm the last one here. I, you know, I, I, mm. I'm not going to lose faith in, in what I'm doing, but man, is it, is it tough to be all by, you know, the only guy, uh, holding down the fort, so to speak. 
Yeah, good pull. That's nice. Nice, nice, nice. Um, yeah, and I do like the Obi Wan Kenobi series. There, there's some, there's certain things that happen and editing choices. I was like, huh, uh, but it does get it a little bit more into his psyche and where he's at, where he comes from, and, and that gap between, you know, Revenge of the Sith and and watching his watching Anakin get cut down, high ground, whatever, and then eventually get to to Luke and stay steadfast to to Luke, and maybe that's. Um, there is more hope because there there are the the twins that are out there. TJ, what what would you say? You know, turn Obi Wan. What are we forgetting about his approach to to the Force, and would that make a difference or not? No, I, I just Obi Wan kind of like I I was gonna say as a transient view of the Force, but it's not really true. We just get to see him from the time he's like seventeen until he's ninety. Mm-hmm. Not really. He goes from like twenty to seventy and just looks really old, but. <laughs> I mean, that's it's just natural for him to he doesn't view the force as a tool like dooku right yep yep yeah that's the difference of qui-gon like and, and um you know in terms of their posture to the the force community i i think um you have the jedi order and and seeing chinks in the armor of this you know, organized religion around the force yeah they're peacekeepers but you see how they can be like be manipulated and their kind of dogmatic approach to the force and, and Qui-Gon was a little bit more gray, a little bit more loose with that. And um, yeah. And then, you know, what is the force? It's something that flows through you. It's going to lead and guide you and, and look to the future and the, the prophecy and the chosen one, or use it as a tool to do what you think is right and, and use it on your own. And I think Count Dooku um, lost faith in, in the Jedi order and wanted to do things his own way and was manipulated by the dark side and, and brought over because he thought that's what would bring order. He could use the tool. Ultimate, the person who ultimately thought they could use the force as a tool for their own wielding of power, of course, is Palpatine. And then he has his, his apprentices that he brought under his own wing so that he can manipulate them. And they were tools in his eyes. He didn't care much about them. They, they were tools in and of themselves for what he wanted. Uh, and that's what Count Dooku became, uh, um, a, a tool to create a civil war that eventually became a tool so that Anakin would make a, a, a deeper choice or a, a, a wrong choice, a beheading, killing, not for peace. And, and he just knew that that wasn't uh, something that that he should have done, and and they just get this step a step closer to the dark side um, of the force. Anything with these two, kind of their history, their approaches that that we need to address before changing some things around. We have our action figures out. We're going to change some storyline. Uh, George Lucas is coming to us asking some questions. Disney saying, if you're going to do a show, and this is the what if you're going to do, we get to write this story. Uh, we get to play in the sandbox a little bit. Yeah, uh, I, I feel like it is important to like recognize when we're talking about this the the jedi as we see them kind of take the it takes a village mentality like you can have your own personal apprentice but that apprentice is also going to work with other masters and knights Mm. and and Mm. so there's not like a like qui-gun does this so does obi-wan that's why like they will inherit traits that they like that they learned but that's not it's not like a one-to-one thing it's not like a father-son kind of thing because there are so many Jedi involved with raising each Padawan, but we're going to ignore that for the purposes of this. What if question? <laughs> That's right. Well, you know, yeah, that was a, as a kid, you're like, yeah, Obi-Wan was like, yeah, I'm going to send you to my master Yoda. And then when he shows up in the prequels with Qui-Gon, I'm like, wait a minute. I thought Yoda was his master. What is going on? But they share, they, they share. Uh, and Yoda has been around a long time. They have different masters, they have different things. They, it's like a school, you know, you don't go to just one professor. You go to a lot of professors in college to study biology or whatever. So um, I think that makes a difference. The school of Jedi and Jedi wizardry. That's right. That's right. There you go. There you go. Do they have a dark arts class? Oh, that's later. I'm not allowed for that one, uh, but they'll uh, go for that. <laughs> All right, let's do some what if in. All right. If we switch this around. Okay. So Obi-Wan is no longer trained by, by Yoda or Qui-Gon, strictly under um, Count Dooku. What what would this change in the Star Wars story? How would this change Obi Wan's personality? Andy, what do you think? That's a tough one. Uh, personality. I, I spent a lot of time thinking about sort of like the the plot uh, and and those kinds of the questions um, and, and gaming out a scenario. But uh, yeah, in terms of his personality, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think there a lot of the things that we. Um, 
touched on that, that he might have been influenced uh, via Qui-Gon. You know, Qui-Gon probably was also influenced by Count Dooku. So I, I'm not sure that it would be a huge mm-hmm. shift in personality, maybe a little bit less uh, less inclined to go you know, by the book uh, with, with the Jedi Order and so forth. You know, maybe a little bit more skeptical or suspicious um, of, yeah. of the decision yeah. making there. But, you know, I think we're talking about shades and, and degrees rather than a, a big shift uh, personality. And, and, you know, it occurred to me, uh, you know, even though we characterize Obi-Wan as a rule follower, and I, you know, I think that's largely accurate, uh, you know, he did, he did make the fairly bold decision to train Anakin uh, yeah. when the entire Jedi Council looked at him and went, no, no way, we are not touching this kid. Uh, we, are not, we don't want to have anything to do with training this kid. Uh, and Obi-Wan you know, took him under. Uh, anyway, so, you know, I think, I think there are, there are facets there that I think, you know, would just be tweaked or, or highlighted maybe a little bit differently, but I don't, I don't see it as being a huge, um, a huge shift in, in perspective. You maybe maybe think of something. So maybe maybe shifting rule follower to being um, more like faithful. He he wants to be faithful to who he feels like he's good. So he, he made a promise to Qui-Gon, he's going to train and he's going to remain faithful to that. He's not budging. Um, and then he made a, a quest. He's going to watch over Luke and Leia, I guess, or, and, and Luke and say, like, I, I'm going to stick with this guy and, and nothing's going to move me from that. So if he was with Count Dooku, maybe maybe he's faithful to him and he and he sees he more leans into this kind of um, being disillusioned from the Jedi Order and follows uh, Count Dooku, uh, maybe off to leave, leaves the order and maybe, maybe Obi-Wan's one that can be easily manipulated to become a Sith later on to the dark side, because he's so faithful to those he's, he feels like he's in debt to, or, or made a promise to. So he made a promise to Qui-Gon, made a promise that he's going to train Anakin. And then, and then later I'm going to, I'm going to watch over Luke and make sure he does it. So he's, he's faithful. Maybe that's what it is rather than a rule follower. He's, he's faithful. John, anything there that spark, you know, in terms of how this would be different and what, how Obi-Wan would approach things. If he's, I think if it would be, golden. I think it would be hugely different. Imagine if Qui-Gon was replaced with Count Dooku in all the scenarios of the um, first movie, like the Phantom Menace, imagining how Count Dooku would have handled um, getting stranded on the planet, how he would have handled meeting the young Anakin, how he would have handled all of the uh, big decision-making and what far-reaching consequences that would have had having him in the place of Qui-Gon, men, you know, mentoring over Obi-Wan in those moments. Man, and would Dooku lose in a lightsaber battle with, with uh, Darth Maul? Would, would, do, do, who do you see winning that fight? If you switch it up and put Qui-Gon, you remove him and put Count Dooku instead of uh, there in, in, in Qui-Gon's place. Yeah, I like, I like, man, I like that movie um, and see where it goes. And then you have the Duel of the Fates where you have the classic swordsman going up against like the the ninja of uh, our, of Darth Maul. What do you, who do you think wins that, John? I think um, Obi-Wan and uh, Dooku would have won the fight in the beginning. Mm. I don't think it would have dragged on as far. I don't think Qui-Gon was as good of a swordsman as Count Dooku. Mm. TJ, no, I do you think- agree? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I don't, honestly, I don't think. I think if Dooku had fought Darth Maul alone, he probably could have won. Okay. Yeah, like Dooku does not rely on the Force, but he is very strong in the Force. Mm-hmm. So, and he's a better swordsman. So, like, it, it's really not. I think it might throw him off for a second, but he's experienced. He's like he's he's fought before. Yeah, he, he basically. What, did he take on three Jedi are there at and at the end of um. Uh, the uh, the um, attack of the clones like takes out Obi Wan, mm-hmm. takes out Anakin, yeah. takes out Yoda, and then flies off. You know, yeah. it's almost like a draw, but but like he doesn't lose, he doesn't get stabbed, he's not, he's he's out. Uh, so t- three big heavy hitters. Um, he yeah. takes. We out also the see him. Start- we see him fight Yoda, and uh, Obi Wan and Anakin at the same time. You know, like yeah. separate occasions, but he fights Obi Wan and Anakin at the same time like four times. Yeah, and it's not until the sure. last time that he lost. <laughs> which is not really his fault but yeah i just i just don't see i love darth maul i don't see darth maul winning that fight because if i yeah. I'm, if i'm fairly certain if we had to order the best duelists in the I almost call it the league for some reason in the order <laughs> uh it would be yoda <laughs> uh, well, the order i'm just gonna count all the jedi and sith it's like yoda palpatine mace windu dooku then maybe darth maul 
but there's a there's a okay. pretty big gap there. But Obi Wan's up there too. Okay, all right, Andy, help me with this one. They've they've sparked some uh, some other questions about we're we're reordering you know Phantom Menace now. So so if Darth Maul is killed and Dooku is not, and now he has Obi Wan and he discovers they discover Anakin, what becomes of Anakin and then Palpatine's way of manipulating it will will we ever see a Darth Vader do we see Palpatine resisted do they all turn to the dark side and get manipulated what the power of or, or of two but like how does that change up the relationship with Anakin eventually I, or as the promised one but then does he ever turn to the dark side or did they both turn to the dark side or the all three of them turn to the dark side I don't know I'm my, my head's spinning here help me out Andy yeah that's that's an interesting one my guess would be Right, so the, so the big thing about the Phantom Menace and and Darth Maul, Darth Maul is that the Jedi become aware of the fact that the Sith are active, yeah. uh, for after a long period of thinking that there were no Sith. Right, so that's kind of the, the big reveal uh, of that of that film. And so I wonder if being directly confronted with the the Sith and and the the reality of the Sith in the present moment, if that makes Dooku, you know, it almost inoculates him to a certain degree against. Uh, manipulation towards the dark side, right? So we don't really know, or at least, you know, in the, in the live action stories, we don't see. Maybe, maybe it's covered in more detail elsewhere. But, you know, by the time we're introduced to Count Dooku, he has already been turned by, uh, Palpatine. So we don't really get to see that, uh, right. that, pro- you know, what that looks like. But if we imagine that it's something similar to what happened with Anakin that we did see, uh, you know, there's that, like slow temptation and sort of like being being drawn in without realizing what it is that you're actually being drawn towards, right? It, yeah. Uh, Palpatine yeah. didn't reveal himself as Sidious right away to, to Anakin, so I imagine something similar would happen. Uh, something similar happened to Dooku since he had also been a Jedi, and so maybe maybe he's more wary of the possibility of other uh, you know other Sith infiltration, other you know Sith influence, um, and is more more on the lookout for that, and so. Maybe he's he's more suspicious of Palpatine. Maybe not as you know another Sith, but having been impacted, or you know he's looking out for that that Sith influence in other other places where he might not have been so wary of it. Otherwise, I don't know. That's my kind of gut reaction there. Like that, TJ. Yeah, see some thoughts. Yeah, I I think there's really no way around the Anakin's corruption. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if he gets turned into a cyborg at this point, uh, mm-hmm. but. That, that's mostly because I don't think Dooku would have fought Anakin at that point. Okay. I think Dooku would have been much more willing to let Anakin go and follow his own ideas, which would have been Palpatine's ideas because, you know, we've at this point, we've kind of lined them all up. Yeah, it's, it's hard to talk like what would happen to Obi-Wan and, and Count Dooku without bringing in Anakin because Anakin is so tied up to Obi-Wan's story and Qui-Gon's story. And so we switch those kind of mentors and, and masters with each other. I, I, this idea of perhaps Dooku and Obi-Wan um, not being ma- manipulated, but there's a different way of, that that Anakin, because if the Jedi order still is like, no, too, too old, uh, too risky. We're not going to train him. Does that then Dooku, does that disenfranchise, disillusion him to the order in another kind of way? Not necessarily what we saw in like tales of the Jedi or other places, but he's like, fine. Um, if, if you won't train him, because I believe he's the promised one or whatever, then, then I'm going to do it on my own and leave the whole order and take him with me. And that's how, uh, Palpatine gets to them. Um, and it's hard to see what Obi-Wan would do there. Is he more loyal to Count Dooku or is he more loyal to Yoda at that point? We've already seen that he's more kind of loyal to, to Qui-Gon and, and so told Yoda, no, I'm going to train him anyway. Um, but there at the end when, or, or when they don't make Anakin a master, he's like, listen to those guys. You know, he, he's, it's not like Obi-Wan kind of sides with the Jedi and says, Anakin, you're being a little bit immature, right? Am I wrong with that? Like, he's he's kind of like, yeah, be patient, be patient. He's like, I don't want to be patient. I, I don't want to be patient. Um, John, help me out here. What uh, what are we going to do with Anakin? We had we had Count Dooku and, and Obi-Wan. What, what do we do with Anakin? So Count Dooku would have a different perspective. I almost feel like he would he would have still become a separatist, and uh-huh. he would have tried to draw an Anakin into that realm. But eventually Palpatine would still have gotten to Anakin because we're still assuming that 
a lot of the other timeline events happen, like Anakin blowing up the uh, the battle droid command ship and other things mm-hmm. like that. But, um, you know, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess I'm wondering I if Obi Wan's gonna who's Obi Wan's gonna be loyal to. Like I, I think Count Dooku's. Yeah, I like your right. Yeah, Count Dooku's gonna be a separatist. He's gonna go off and do his own thing. Anakin, it, it eventually, is gonna turn to the dark side so that he can be. There's something about his fate of being uh, Darth um, and a Sith, and and to you know eventually come back around. Yeah, whether he'll have his limbs cut off or a cyborg, or whether he's gonna be more powerful after that. But I'm still trying to think about what, how, where would Obi Wan land with with this. Uh, I, I do think Obi Wan would, in this scenario, would end up going with Dooku, because he's been raised by apprentice to Dooku. He's kind of adopted some of his mannerisms. I would think, like his tendency to act more regal and appeal more to his own desires than the Jedi Order would like. Yeah. So, I, I so here's a scenario. Yeah, go ahead, Andy. Go. I, I'm. I'm I guess, uh, you know. Counterpoint a little bit. Uh, you know, another yeah. thing that we we've seen about Obi Wan, especially in the recent television series, is his care for children. Right? Uh-huh. He, he can't. You know, there's a lot that would tell him he should walk away from this Princess Leia mission. Right? There's a lot of different times where he he could or he should, or it seems like that would be the, the logical thing to do. But he can't. Uh, he can't do that. He can't let her uh, suffer. He can't let her go. Um, and you know, and then we also know that he spends so many uh, years of his life watching over Luke. Yeah. And you know, even we see a little bit uh, yeah. in Phantom Menace, right? He he has some concern for Anakin as a child, and so I I, I find it hard to picture that Obi Wan looking at Anakin as as a young boy, right? If we're talking about that first kind of moment of, or is he going to be trained or not? Uh, I find it hard to imagine any version of Obi Wan looking at at that young man and saying. No, we're gonna we're gonna leave him to his own devices. Ah, I love that. Yes, thank you. Um, I love children. I um, I love the youth of my church. I love my own kids. I love camp. I love youth ministry. So yes, Obi Wan being a youth pastor or a youth leader and taking kids under his arms makes me happy. I, I like that. Um, uh, here here's what I'm thinking though. So if I'm gonna rewrite this movie, here's what I. Kind of, if we're gonna have Christopher Lee be be the one to lead us through all the movies and into the original trilogy, maybe we have uh, Count Dooku rebels against Palpatine, ends up killing Palpatine, and he becomes the Dark Sith Lord, and Anna becomes his uh, Sith apprentice, and they rule the universe in a different kind of way rather than than palps so um i like this idea of of count dooku really going into the dark side and like nope now that i have like a really like um powered up anakin without being a cyborg and uh and and uh uh, breathing machine and, and that kind of thing maybe maybe he just um he kills Palps and and then they rule the universe together until uh, Obi Wan, you know, find find some kids, whether it's Luke or Leia or somebody else. You know, you don't know if um, does does uh, Padme die in in this version too, or does she go off with Anakin and they're like the dark uh, king and queen of the universe? Uh, does she still die? Is there something there that um, you know? Is that what the fate is that turns Anakin to the dark side and? You still have the twins that, that Obi Wan has to look over and, and swing back around with. Um, but I like this idea of Dooku killing Palps, and now you have Christopher Lee as the main dark villain of the original trilogy. What do you guys think? That would have been way cooler than Palpatine is back. <laughs> <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow, somehow. John, can you see Count Dooku as like this the evil Sith Lord sitting in his throne room? Could that be it? I think he would be in this scenario. I think the separatists would have won the war, and mm. then the the there would be the separatists and the uh, the republic would be separate entities. And it would be I don't think he'd be like an imperial ruler because he wasn't really about that. That was kind of Sidious's thing and his Sidious's influence. He really just kind of wanted to separate from the republic, which is why they were the uh, you know the confederacy in the first place. Right, and I think his influence in Anakin Obi Wan's life, in Obi Wan's life, I think Obi Wan would have ended up marrying Queen Satine and leaving the Jedi uh, Order, and I think okay. that Anakin would have still married Padme, and I think they would have had a different dynamic. But again, in the uh, the the timeline, I think Palpatine's influence would have still accomplished a lot of the same things. But in this case, I believe that it, the Separatists would have been a 
a faction in the Republic would have lost the war, so to speak. It's now now you have some Obi Wan Jedi babies running around, a whole different kind of thing. <laughs> Jedi Mando babies. <laughs> Jedi Mando babies. Yeah. Oh, that's the title of this episode, Joshua. Jedi Mando babies. Come mm. on, that's what we want. Um, they would have had the new shows on for sure. <laughs> that's right. TJ, do you like that? Do you do you like that scenario? Do you want do you want to marry off Obi Wan and and have some oh, Jedi yeah. Mando babies? Yeah, that's that's what he deserves. I think so. I think so too. I like that. I like that. Um, all right, uh, Andy, you and I are, are probably the elders here who've been around with Star Wars the longest time and seen these movies the longest. Does this change uh, kind of Luke's fate and Luke's story? Because this has a trickle down effect down down the line. A turn of Anakin. If it's going to affect Anakin, it's going to it's going to affect Luke. How does this how does this affect Luke, Andy? Right. Well, I mean, it sounded like some of these scenarios, right? There isn't a Luke, uh, so that's that's Oof. a big change. Uh, yeah. But let, let's let's assume uh, that there you know there is some uh, loop uh, in in one of these versions of the timeline. Um, yeah, I mean you know does he does he grow up uh, you know under under Emperor Dooku and Darth Vader? Does he grow up to be the next uh, Sith in line? Right? Mm -hmm. is, is he? We we saw those flashes of of darkness in him uh, in the original trilogy and and even into you know Episode Eight. Yeah. Uh, does you know? Does he encourage? Right. Maybe. Do they rethink the the rule of two? Right. The the familial lineage there. Uh, does that does that cause That's... Anakin to rethink? Uh, the you know I I want I want there to be a place for my son, but I don't want to have to to kill my uh, my master or my apprentice. Um, That's what I want. <clears throat> maybe maybe there's just sort of a natural transition. Right. Maybe Dooku uh, doesn't live forever, and so there's a natural transition from. Dooku and Anakin to Anakin and, and Luke, you know, there's a fairly dark. And so maybe, maybe now you have a, a brother sister conflict. Maybe Leia is still the the revolutionary, mm. uh, the, yeah. the the dark sheep of the family. Uh, she goes off, uh, you know, maybe influenced, you know, still influenced by her mother. You know, th I think that's a, a bigger question, right? What does what does Leia look mm. like having grown up uh, with her with her biological mother, right? Uh, you know, we see we see a lot that they have in common. Right. And so maybe maybe she becomes even more. Uh, I mean, it's hard to imagine her becoming even more of a leader and, and you know, more precocious than she already was. Right? But, uh, you know, maybe <clears throat> we see some more encouragement in that direction as opposed to you know, we, the, the Obi-Wan series suggested a little bit of, you know, her, her adopted parents weren't totally on board with her precociousness. Uh, but maybe uh, maybe her mother, you know, her biological mother encourages that a little bit more, you know, as somebody who was a queen at the age of whatever, you know, nine, 11, whatever it was, uh, encourages that more. And so maybe, maybe there's a lot more sibling conflict there. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and what if, what if she's raised from the beginning to be a Jedi, not just like as a, as a queen or a low, like let's start her yeah. as a Padawan younger. And then you do right. have that conflict. It's not the rule of two, but you have this f f family tree of, of force that, that has impact. And so then it becomes not just like a, as, as John was saying, like separatist civil war among um, like the planets and the systems, but you have, you have this family uh, divorce or schism and, and then their approaches to the force. And you have this um, kind of yin and yang, like my shirt of Luke and Leia going at it. Um, so, so TJ, yeah, you're biting at the bit. You want to see a trained uh, yeah. Leia as, as a Jedi. I, like I do. Oh yeah. That's, that's what I want. I want the legends Leia back. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, I love that. I, I think we created a, a, a good movie and alternate timeline here of, of how things will go. And I think you could still, even later on with like the Disney trilogy of the, um, the force awakens, you could then even in the midst of this Jedi and this empire or whatever, and if the re rebellion wins, you still have this kind of tension between this, this family, but you have a force, like, even if Luke does, like, he's not the legend of, um, maybe, him, uh, Anakin, and and Luke rule the universe as father and son under this kind of oppression as a Sith. But then, um, you know, you still have Leia out there, and you do you can still see the Force awakens as as another Jedi Order, or someone else pop up. Uh, that the the Force is then birthing or lifting up to bring balance and, uh, to the Force in, in the universe. I, I like that alternate. Um, kind of timeline there, John. What do you think? What do you, what else needs to be tweaked there? You know, I, I know you're an OG guy, um, but you got this Disney. What what would what would the the 
uh, seven, eight, nine look like if this is the way things went with Luke and Leia? That is a good question. Um, because you'd want to know if the major events still stay the same, if Luke still overcomes his father, or um, because if if Darth Sidious is out of the question and Dooku reigns supreme as a separatist leader, then wondering how the you know Darth Vader come into play at all, or if you know Darth Sidious just ruled the the Republic and not the uh, separatists. Um, it's an interesting dynamic trying to think of how far in the future would be affected if just simply Count Dooku replaced Qui-Gon in the uh, the timeline. Yeah. What a difference that makes. Uh, because it's still Star Wars, right? You still have this intergalactic Star War between Rebels and uh, the Empire. You have a Civil War. You have the Clone Wars. You, you the, the Rise of the Sith. You, you have Attack of the Clones. I mean, these, it's, it's, War in space, the Star Wars. So, so there's lots. So there still would be conflict. There would still be this war, but this tension between light and dark, uh, between that, it changes different when you change just one chess piece out of the way and, and change a mentor in. It, it does have a ripple effect in, in how that that is. And, and this this um, map that TJ showed up here of all these kind of interweavings of of these Jedi and and how they're connected and and who they're. Um, leading or or mentoring or manipulating, uh, change some of these around a little bit, and and you have a different story or a different way that react. And I think that goes to show just how important our relationships are and how we treat um, treat our relationships, you know, and, and the decisions we we make. That you know we we are in an entangled uh, web of relationships, and and the choices we make and how we act in those. Uh, makes a difference with others, um, not just how I treat people, but but the the relationships I choose to be a part of and pay attention to makes a difference. And there's big what ifs out there in terms of how much energy or intentionality I put behind the relationships that I'm entrusted with. Guys, just in, in thinking of like the relationships we're entrusted with and what ifing, what 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 comes to mind in terms of thinking about like our faith and the communities that we're a part of? Well, I mean, it's it's kind of like the uh, it's a wonderful life type of story where it's like if I wasn't here and someone else was in my place doing this same job, what would be affected? And that's effectively what we're doing with Count Dooku in this scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Andy, what do you think? It, you know, it's a, it's a great question, right? You, know, you can always uh, point to, uh, you can look back and, and see certain people having had an impact, right? So if someone invited me to this uh, session or, or that uh, uh -huh. activity um, somebody handed me a Bible or somebody challenged me with this or that. And so, you know, what would have been different if that person hadn't been there at that moment? Um, you know, at the same time, you know, we have, we have personalities that have, you know, some core features that, that are persistent. So maybe somebody else would have, you know, steered us, someone else, something else would have come along. We would have wound up in the same direction, but you know, that's a, it's the, one of the classic questions, right? How much of who we are is contingent on very specific and unrepeatable events and how much of it is, you know, part of trends and, patterns that are stable and, and persistent. Um, you know, I, I can think of, um, you know, the specific moments uh, in my you know history where, you know, a specific teacher or a specific uh, uh, leader asked me a question or, you know, gave me a suggestion and, you know, that has stuck in my head, right? How impactful that was, I don't know, but it, it stands out as a memory, which makes me think that it uh, was significant in some way or something that I come back to. Uh, and so, you know, presumably, you know, a lot of people have those for, you know, whether their career or their faith journey or their family situation or whatever. Uh, and so, yeah, you know, it, it's, it's impossible to answer, right? We, we can't really experience counterfactuals, right. but, uh, but <laughs> I, I think it's worth, uh, looking back, right? That, um, you know, we, <clears throat> what are the, what are the markers that say, well, this is the way that we came. We don't want to go backwards. Uh, and we don't want to forget where we've been or, or where we've come from. Yeah. Put some importance of some of the decisions. Away. I, I've definitely had, you know, former youth of mine uh, come up to me. It's like, uh, Pastor, well, I remember when you said this. I'm like, oh, my gosh, what did I say? And I don't remember saying what it, what they said, but I guess I said it because I had an impact. And I'm like, whoo, I'm glad. You know, it just makes me like, God, I should be. You know, I am mindful of and in the weight of, of my action and words I know makes a difference. So so I try to be take take that seriously. But there are times you're like, man, I, I, I hope I don't say anything to. Uh, embarrass myself or others or, or tear people down, but instead of build, build people up. TJ, how about you in terms of thinking about what if in your life or the relationships that, that make you more mindful or more intentional or, uh, or, or is there a kind of a fate that, you know, things are going to happen as, as they happen or not? 
Yeah, I think if you if you took like one of my theological mentors, like if you took my grandpa and replaced him with Count Dooku, things would be slightly different. One hundred percent. More so. One, or yeah, yeah, more elegant sword fighting, a different size yeah, hilt, a lot more. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think about this. Like this question comes to me because, like, I think about you know I've been at this church, Holy Trinity, for twelve years now, and and I had a hard decision because I, I loved my last church so much, and it was a hard decision to leave that one to come here, but we felt like it was a good good call and and uh, the right time in our lives and the age of our girls and and Cindy's career, and but I think about like if I didn't take that car. I stayed in, in South Carolina, how things were different. Like I would not be on this podcast right now. I wouldn't, I, it, it would be, it'd be different. Maybe I would be, maybe I would still met Joshua and, and TJ somewhere else in a, in a different kind of way, but, but it would like definitely an alternate timeline. Like what if, if I, if I just stayed in South Carolina at Christmas Victor Lutheran, what, how in my life he didn't, who would I have met or not met or what, how would I build upon what, what would have happened? And, in the world. So, so it's hard. Again, like John said, that's a wonderful life, how things would be different. But, um, you know, it just goes to show like being mindful of our decisions and who we're connected with makes, makes a difference, makes a difference. Oh, friends, thank you for uh, thinking through this thought experiment with us. When we talk about Star Wars, man, I love Star Wars so much. And again, I'm going to probably do more what if when it comes to Star Wars and uh, with shows of past and movies of present and shows of future, I'm going to what if, man, I, I'm, I'm already what if the acolyte coming down the road and what they're going to do with the show and how that makes an impact on other things. I'm going to try to calm my expectations and uh, as, as TJ is a good mentor and my Jedi master when it comes to expectations and uh, letting be letting things be or what they should be on their own rather than me um, rewrite them before they ever happen. Um, but we have a bonus question for you all. And if you hop on Patreon and just a couple bucks a month support us over there, you can get this in the Patreon feed. Uh, you'll get the answer to our question. I know you're dying to know the bonus question, which is who would you want to mentor you in the ways of the force. Those who are listening out there, you may have your answer, but if you want to know Will's answer, Andy's answer, John's answer, TJ's answer, you got to join Patreon. Hop over there. We're going to answer it and we will uh, share with you. We'll share with you uh, who would we want to mentor us. Would we go Sith? Would we go uh, light side would where, 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 what impact would that be come on over there and see uh, friends thank you so much for listening to another episode of Systemic Ecology keep a look out on the socials what the next what if could be you could place your vote and, uh, and, and you can make an impact on what our next what if episode should or could be thank you for listening we know there's a lot of choices out there when it comes to podcasts and know that uh, yeah we love you. Uh, the geek verse loves you. The force loves you. And you are not alone. And remember, you are chosen people, the geekdom of priests. Boom. Hi, uh, my name is TJ. I'm here to tell you about the Systematic Ecology Shop. That's where we post all of our merch. It is hosted on uh, Creator Spring. And we have a ton of really cool merch, uh, mostly clothing. We have hats, extra soft t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies, and more. Our hosts wear them all the time. It's actually super comfy. Uh, we have glassware, mugs, which everybody loves a good mug. Fill out your cupboard. Get rid of some old ones, which is the part that I never do. And that's why I have too many cups. Uh, we have cloth bags, posters, uh, and this, it's really stuff. We like to put our icons on there. We like to put quotes, uh, things we come up with. Uh, and it's cool. It's a cool way. And a lot of it is pretty subtle, too, uh, to show support for one of your favorite shows. And my personal favorite is actually our SG dad cap, which I've <laughs> I haven't been reluctant to buy it because now I have to wear hats at work and then I get tired of wearing hats but it's really cool it's really understated it is our logo right here and then it says Systematic Ecology on the back it's great it's a really good hat we have a few of them floating around uh, check it out and if we could all just rock the, the SG dad cap in public I think that'd be pretty sweet <laughs> If you love our show, you can follow the whole network in a single feed on Spotify at Anna's Our Ministry Podcast or the network page on Apple Podcasts. 
There you'll find shows like The Homely, The Whole Church Podcast, My Seminary Life, Let Nothing Move You, Dummy for Theology, The Bible After Hours, as well as mine and my husband's show, The Clies, where my husband Taylor and I go through weekly discussions in a devotional conversational method to help us all get closer to one another and God.